Hello and welcome to the DSP Leaders Summit on Open Access. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content at Telecom TV. And coming up now is our Challenges and Opportunities Roundtable, where we'll be discussing the evolution of fixed broadband access in an open, cellular-first world. Now, advances in cellular have narrowed the gap between fixed and wireless, two traditional separate deployment models, which begs the questions, where is the future market for fixed access? And what is the economic justification of continued innovation, investment and deployment? Well, let's find out what our guests think. And I am delighted to introduce Peter Bell, Director of Network Technology for OpenReach. Daniel Cortes, Fixed Access Network Manager, Technology and Information Department at Telefonica. Ronan Kelly. CTO EMEA and APAC for ADTRAN, and Craig Thomas, Vice President, Strategic Marketing and Business Development with the Broadband Forum. Hello everyone, very good to see you all. Thank you for taking part in the round table. Now, we've come up with a set of key questions on open access derived from our editorial coverage and input from our viewers. So to begin with, Daniel, let me ask the first question to you first. What does fixed mobile convergence mean to network operators in 2021? Well, thank you for, for letting me begin with, with this question. Uh, well, in Telefonica, we have been working for, for many years in, in the fixed mobile convergence. It is not a thing that, that we have just started uh, right now. We have been doing our planning and our deployment, uh, thinking on, on a multi-service FTTH network so we have been coordinating all, all the fiber deployments between residential customers, enterprise, and also mobile backhauling, which is the, the, the key question here. What we have been doing is optimizing our deployments to take advantage of the FTTH networks. And whenever it has been possible, use, use GPON uh, and the FTTH itself to, to make the backhauling, for example, for, for, for G small cells and, and so on. Uh, we have also been deploying uh, vacant fibers uh, for for point to point use cases where uh, not the small cells uh, are are deployed and, and macro and and of course Gpon is is a bit uh, well short of of technology for for this deployment so up to this point we have been doing this for for these years but however right now we are in an opportunity to to make a huge change here because with the disaggregation and uh, and the openness of the access we're starting to, to rethink in a, a new model where, where we will be pursuing the, the real convergence in, in the access. So we are starting to, to think on, on the future, uh, not only fixed access and, and mobile access, but a, a real converged access. So we are starting to think in about its computing, the, the infrastructure in, in those edge central offices, uh, also all the servers that, that will be hosted there, and, and our main target here and our main objective here is that uh, we will have in the near future the same common infrastructure of course we will be having uh, physical limits like well upon networks always will need a upon optic line and, and equipment for for working with that but all the processing all the servers all the centralized structures that that we might have uh, running all together to to improve the performance to improve our our deployments and to optimize uh, our deployments uh, it's what we foresee in the in the very near future and what we are right now uh, working to to have a, a convert and a unique access between fixed and, and mobile thank you daniel uh, peter convergence we've been speaking about convergence for a very long time but here in 2021 with the, with the state of our, our networks today and our models business models today what does fixed mobile convergence actually mean to operators now so so it's hugely exciting in the uk and um, open reach is the wholesaler of, for of access in in the uk we've just announced we're rolling out fiber to 25 million homes ftp to 25 million homes and as a consequence we're, we're rolling out fiber and a very rich fiber rollout in the uk which is great because that allows us the opportunity to serve all the 5G masts and all the 5G and small cells. So in actual fact, they're, they're complementary solutions. So 5G will happen, people will use 5G, 
and we will provide the backbone for that 5G with our fiber deployment. And, and like Telefonica, we're looking at how we can use FTTP type solutions and also point as well as point to point. So I think it's it's hugely exciting. Uh, I think the it's 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 a bit of a phony war between 5G fixed and, and mobile. Actually, they're complementary. And and I think the disaggregated solution allows opportunities for for other players and flexibility in that solution. Thank you, Peter. I like the phony war there, uh, Ronan. Um, and as our vendor representative on on the panel, you know, what are you seeing amongst the operator community, amongst your your customers? You know, has the has the nature of fixed mobile convergence changed? Um, what what does it mean here in twenty twenty one? Um, I, I think I have to reiterate Peter's point with regard to a phony war. From the point of view, if we look at the usage for mobile handsets the portion of usage that's attributed over Wi-Fi networks to begin with for mobile handsets out there is substantial. And all of that Wi-Fi traffic is naturally then traversing back over the fixed infrastructure. So the experience that users have on their, their mobile devices today, I think it's fair to say would not be the same experience without the substantial investments that have happened on the fixed infrastructure. I think also as well, Peter and Daniel both touched on a point with regard to the fiber build outs that are occurring under OpenReach and Telefonica and you know, they're substantial investments. And quite often we see people look, I, I'll say a little bit disparaging towards the pawn infrastructures that are being built out, particularly in their role to play as part of a backhaul or cross haul infrastructure for the 5G cell sites and 6G cell sites in the future. And what people often lose sight of is, you know, the pawn is an architecture, it's not a technology. Just because I build out a fiber architecture based on a pawn topology, doesn't mean I can't deploy point-to-point -point wavelength technologies over that to offer very similar um, experiences to what would happen if I had a dedicated point-to-point -point full fiber all the way to the mass site. So all of these pawn architectures that are built, being built across the developed countries in Europe over the next five years have a massive role to play in serving as the backhaul infrastructure for the cellular industry, regardless of whether it's a PON technology on that PON infrastructure or whether it's a point-to-point -point technology. Thank you, Ronan. And, and Craig, um, coming from your perspective, Broadband Forum, um, what are you seeing as the, the nature of, of fixed and mobile convergence? What, what, what do you feel that convergence means to operators now? So I think there's two aspects to this and from a, a broadband forward membership, both a vendor and a service provider, as well as open source, you know, there is the, the utilization of assets to serve both uh, the mobile, the, the, the 5G and future 6G, as well as the fixed access requirements, you know, and, and utilizing it to its best capabilities that everyone has just talked about. And then there's the move towards what we call uh, wireless wireline convergence itself, where you're looking at the service layer and, and adapting services on top of that, so that you have a continuity between services, whether that person may be on a 5G remote gateway or a, a handset or a fixed network RG. Uh, how do you make that a seamless experience? And that's moving on to the true service convergence, more than just the network delivery aspect of it all. Uh, common authentication, some mediation level between the 5G core and the fixed access network, etc. Thank you, Craig. Well, let's move on to um, the next question. And this is, an, this is an area that our viewers in particular are, are, are always bring up with us. And that is the, you know, the, what trends are we seeing that is driving this evolution? Peter, what would you say are the main trends in, in technology or, or operations that are driving change in the broadband access network? So, so I think the disaggregated solution that we've we've done a first deployment of this year is a great trend. Uh, it allows us flexibility, modularity, and the, the capability to augment our network pr pretty easily. Uh, but that in itself um, is, is not sufficient. And, and I think the use of that with SDN creates a really powerful tool in order for operators to manage its network, add new services on, uh, and also just apply policies across the network. So those will be two key technologies. Beyond that, with rolling out of the vast amount of fiber we are, we need tools and techniques to ensure that we are delivering very high quality uh, network as, as it's being built. And, and those are the areas we're focusing on in open reach. 
Thank you, Peter. And Daniel, are you seeing a similar trends to, to Peter in, uh, to, in Telefonica's network as to the, the main technology um, trends that, that are driving change in our networks? Yes, in fact, I'm afraid I'm going to sound a bit repetitive because I think we are de de deploying like based on, on two main pillars. And the first and the main and basic pillar that we are right now, of course, is the, the technology evolution as, as a business as usual uh, with XGSPON, combo pon ports to, to mix our current GPON customers to, to the next uh, level with XGSPON. And of course, the 25 GPON, 50 GPON or, or whatever comes, comes later. Uh, and this is like for us, like business as usual, but the main disruptor and the main change that is going to happen is what what Peter has just said. We are also working in what we call open broadband program, where we are trying not just to deploy a disaggregated access only, it's a full change of paradigm where we want to, to change all our architecture, to, to make open interfaces, to, to have a multi-vendor environment. Uh, again, as Peter said, introduce new services, applications. So, so in, in the end, yes, I, I think mainly we see the same trends here, and and the disaggregation and openness is going to be key for for the next years for sure. Thank you, and Ronan, we've heard from our two operators on the the roundtable today. What what are there any additional trends that that you are seeing, or, or is it like you know, disaggregation and open access is is the main driver? Well, Guy, as, as I'm sure you're aware, over the years, you know, over the last four or five years, Adtran has been pushing really hard to drive the industry transition towards open disaggregated um, OLT platforms. And, you know, thankfully, we're seeing fantastic traction on that. And we're seeing the early positive results as well of some of those deployments for us. We've always got to be looking ahead because there's a lag between, you know, when we first propose innovations to the market and when they see actual adoption. And what we're seeing now, thanks to the fantastic work in building out the fiber infrastructures from the likes of Open Region Telefonica, is we're shifting the bottleneck now within the industry. What was the bottleneck within the WAN infrastructure within the network, where, you know, particularly with a lot of the copper based technologies, we were kind of capped at 100 meg type services. Now it's so much fiber being built out, gigabit is rapidly becoming the new norm but then the challenge becomes for the consumer oh i've got a gigabit to my doorstep but i'm still only getting 50 meg or 100 meg around the house and how do i deal with that and that's where we're seeing the industry is really starting to shift their focus now as they bring that gigabit service rate to their consumers they're having to take control of that in-home experience so that they can have whole home coverage but in an automated managed type environment and in a very similar fashion to what we've seen on the OLT side of things where that desire to implement open implementations likewise we're seeing that now increasingly on the on the CPE side of things with um, initiatives like OpenSync for example which will allow um, service providers to deploy a mix of different hardware vendors within the home. So I might have a residential gateway from Adtran and uh, let's say a, um, an extender, an access point extender maybe from a third party. And I might take it then an automated management solution that maintains in an, um, a proactive fashion that whole home consumer or F environment on a real time basis and take that from another party again altogether. So having open access and open implementations on the CPE side and the OLT side really puts the power back in the hands of the operators as they pick their destiny as they go forward. Thanks, Ron. And Craig, you know, th these, these technology trends are, are very important, but, you know, as was mentioned in, in the question there, you know, there's, there's operational changes that are going on, there's, the, there's the economic changes. It's, 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 it's a big mix of factors that seems to be driving um, overall evolution of broadband access networks. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, whilst we talk about virtualization of services and disaggregation as main trends, we cannot ignore the fact that there's a lot of investment already in the networks, legacy investment uh, from Adtran and from other vendors. And, and that, that migration story, you know, no one is going to revolutionize their network overnight. So we've got to make sure that there is the ability um, to migrate uh, across to, you know, existing hardware platforms to a totally virtualized and disaggregated network uh, and understand the investment that the vendors are making in partnering with service providers.
all the way to the home so that you know as as ronan's just said um the user experience at the end of the day has to be the end goal whether that's deployed via a mobile or a fixed network a gigabit or even a copper um, so that you are now managing multiple users uh, inside the home, maybe multiple customers. I mean, what COVID has taught us is that broadband connection, um, you know, is now a residential customer. It's also a business home working customer, plus IoT and application vendors are working across that. And you've got to manage that experience, not just to the home, but across the Wi-Fi to the device. So OpenSync and, and Broadband Forum's USP, TRC369, is actually you know, driving that experience that we're looking at multiple customers across the single broadband network. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Um, we had an interesting, very interesting question in from our audience. Um, is it possible yet for the same physical networking and IT systems to enable wired and wireless access services to all types of end users? And if so, would this single access approach ever be the optimum configuration from an economic and operational perspective. So do we think a single access approach is, is viable and the best way to go forward? That seems to be the question. Uh, anyone like to, to tackle this one first? I think it does represent, from a consumer's perspective, greater transparency. If you can have that seamless environment between the two different network types uh, in a way that the consumer does not have to interact with it. I've long believed that the goal for any service provider, particularly in the fixed space, and um, particularly when they're providing in-home Wi-Fi, et cetera, is to disappear, is to become invisible to the consumer, just like the electricity provider, that the consumer just uses it without thinking about it and pays the bill every month and never questions it. Whenever the consumer has to think about it, that represents a churn risk. So if you can get your point to the point where you as both a mobile and fixed provider of services can provide that seamless experience for the consumer so that they never have to stop and change settings on their phone or on their laptop, et cetera, that creates a huge amount of traction and loyalty amongst that customer base. We are in early stages of bringing obviously the OSS environments that can handle all the various different handoffs between the networks in a seamless fashion. But I think to Peter's point, as we move into a modern era of software defined networking, the flex flexibility that the new network architectures bring to the table will facilitate that type of um, capability. Thank you very much, Ronan. Anybody else like to, to comment on, on that particular question? Craig? Yes, yeah, so um, from an aspect of does it ever make sense, first of all, you know, it depends on who you are as a service operator. Are you having, are you a retail provider with both wireless and fixed assets, of course? Um, but there are ways that's working now. Yeah. We have a, a, a wireless wireline convergence group that's working with intermediate uh, levels and introducing AGFs and in future FMIFs as well yeah. that really interact between the 5G core and the fixed access network for both types of service. So therefore you are bringing in things like you know, BNG and disaggregated BNG depending on your network architectures to make that a reality. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we've got great examples here uh, from both a Telefonica and, and an open reach perspective of a retail versus an infrastructure provider. Um, and, you know, where we are seeing network requirements are moving forward in the future, I guess, to sort of like fixed access network sharing. And how do we make that a reality that whatever your type of service, whether you are both an FMC provider or just one a mobile or a separate access network only, fixed access network only. You can share that investment because digging the fiber or whatever it may be costs the most money. And that what we're seeing now is a lot of interaction between SDN and FE and, and what we call FANS, fixed access network sharing. Thanks, Craig. And Daniel, did you like to comment on the single access question? Yes, uh, and I think it was great uh, what Greg just said because uh, we are going, we are converging in most of our main markets and where we weren't, we are going uh, converging with fixed and mobile uh, offer at the same time. Uh, we are also pushing, as, as you have just said, uh, the, these kind of joint ventures with, with infrastructure providers uh, in Germany, for example, also in Brazil and Chile. So we think that this is one big trend uh, and evolution for, for this part. 
And whenever we enter in, in these convergent markets, uh, we need to offer as, a, as an operator uh, an advantage. We, we have the capability to do so. And, and I think if we haven't done before, it was because it was two totally different networks. But regarding the first point that we were discussing, this, this fixed mobile convergence and the, and the reuse of the infrastructure, try to share the same, the same servers and, and common infrastructure, I think we can try a, a, and we will coordinate and synchronize these, these two networks to try to make or to make seamless the experience from Wi-Fi to 5G and, uh, and all the handover between these technologies uh, to, our, to our customers. And I think most of them, they are, they are expecting to do so. Uh, and I think for everyone, it is a bit annoying when, when you're at home and disconnects from the, from the mobile network, comes to the Wi-Fi or, or you lose Wi-Fi and have some minutes or well, some seconds until until you are in the in the other network so i think that that experience we need to make it seamless and, and well we are going for it of course good to hear thank you daniel um let's should we take a a, a closer look at disaggregated architectures because it's a it's a subject that generates a lot of interest on the site um so our next question is about the, the benefits what are, what are the benefits of software defined open disaggregated architectures in the fixed broadband network and i'm sure we'll hear from uh, an example of one particular open source development from the broadband forum in a, in a second or two but we'd like to know really um you know how some of these projects are likely to impact uh, operators networks and operations uh peter do you want to have some comments about um, the impact of uh, open disaggregated networks yeah so so as i said we we've deployed our first disaggregated solution um uh, this year and and it's it's going really well and we've learned already that actually they create huge opportunity but also some challenges as well uh, in terms of for operations we need to ensure it's simple enough but maintains that flexibility and, and that's the, the real real challenge that we're up for and the real balance that we're driving at uh, i think when you you fold in sdn i think you, you've then got to consider how how can you take advantage of that uh, and one of the reasons we're focusing on SDN is the, the promise that we'll be able to configure new services and new, new solutions very quickly and have the ecosystem of our network and systems together working as one far tight, more tightly. And that's what we're working towards. So we're currently in, as I said, we deployed our disaggregated solution and we're currently doing proof of concepts of some SDN solutions from, from our vendor community. And of course, time will tell how, how well we do that, but we're very confident that the merging of those two capabilities will, will prove a real benefit and a real leading edge for OpenWitch. Great, thanks, Peter. Uh, Craig, um, we talk about open source developments. The Broadband Forum has, has got one in particular, you know, the, the open broadband, broadband access abstraction. Um, how, 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 how successful is that? And, and projects like this, what is the impact on access network architectures? Well, first of all, apologies for making it a tongue twister, OBBAA, <laughs> Open Broadband, Broadband Access Abstraction. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's twofold. Of course, it's open source software that's available to the wider industry. You know, absolutely, it's an open source. Um, and we talk about disaggregation and cloud CEO and virtualization of services. But it's also a reference implementation um, so that when you are looking at things like white box OLTs, virtual OMCI, as well as the whole cloud SDN NFE services on top of that, um, you've got to recognize, as I mentioned earlier, that this is a migration and people have invested a lot of money with their vendors and their existing OLTs, their existing VNGs. Uh, and until that's amortized, how do you drive that um, migration to a pure SDN NFE environment that uh, we were talking about from an open reach perspective while still using that legacy investment. And that's where a lot of the OBBAA work as an implementation is referenced more than just an open source works so that we bring all the vendors that are interested together. Uh, BT, for example, is, is one of the service providers that have driven this requirement and this reference implementation with the vendor community, including Adtran and a number of others of the leading um, uh, vendor community there, that drives that aspect of saying, this is what we have. We know that the pure cloud CO, STN, NFE environment is where we want to go. 
Now, how do we migrate? And that's where OBBAA and all of the work that we do in the demos and et cetera comes in uh, that offers a, a path to, with your existing vendors and building the relationship with the existing vendors, as well as introducing third parties and, and maybe in the future, even white box scenarios. Thanks, Craig. Yeah. Ronan, what is the benefit for, for going down the software defined disaggregated route then? How, how are these how are these technologies and projects actually shaping our fixed access networks? For us at Ladtran, the key benefits that we see come down to probably three primary benefits, which is power, control, and choice. And on power, it's about putting the power back in the hands of the operators. Quite often, if you look at how the industry has functioned over the last number of decades, the operators themselves, every so often, will have a requirement for certain equipment to fulfill a certain need in a certain part of the network. They'll go out to tender and they'll make a decision at that point in time based on whatever solution best meets their technical requirements and meets their commercial needs. However, typically the solutions they're selecting, then they must live with those solutions in their network for 10, 15 years. And the challenge they have is the cost of introducing an alternative because of the legacy systems and the lock-in that goes with them is prohibitively high. So the service provider's own strategy then is restricted from that point going forward. In an open disaggregated environment, you have the flexibility to be very easily able to move between vendors. If you're not satisfied with the quality or the price or the innovation coming from vendor A, you can then move very easily to vendor B without having to re-architect the entire network. The, 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 flexibility that you get with the solutions as well is critically important. What we see now is we're creating new implementations of traditional OLT systems that allow for much smaller deployments and much more linear growth models available to the service providers. So they can scale within one family of products from 100 users to 100,000 users without having to completely re-architect the OSS environment to be able to cope with that. So there's a, a number of critical benefits to that service provider community around having the choices as they deploy their network, what architecture they want to deploy, which vendors they want to deploy from the hardware side of things, what software they want to implementation implement on that hardware as well. It's giving them that control that they can control their own destiny as they go forward. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, moving on, though, and it's, this is still very much related, Daniel, is disaggregation moving fast enough in fixed networks? And what impact is this trend having today? And do we as an industry need to accelerate our efforts? Well, uh, as I like to say, uh, I would be deploying or Telefonica would be deploying the, these kind of networks uh, yesterday or as soon as possible. Uh, you have just heard the, the benefits that, that well, my colleagues and, and all the industry we, we see with these new architectures. Uh, flexibility, uh, simplifying IT systems, uh, new third-party applications, new vendors, uh, no proprietary interfaces, uh, very easy uh, and smooth migration from one to another. So we all know, or, or most of us know, know the, the benefits that, that are behind that. So w why we are not moving yet or, or, or not so quickly? Because of course there are many, many challenges to, to, to address before we can do so. Uh, as, as some of my colleagues have, have mentioned, uh, we have a, a, a huge legacy implementation uh, with traditional vendors that up to now, uh, well, of course, is working fine and, and it's with, with customers over that. Uh, for you to have a very quick idea, in, in Telefonica Spain, we have already deployed more than 25 million home past, or in Brazil, more than 15 million home past. So, that is with traditional vendors OLTs, uh, and, and it is hard uh, to, to change that from, from one day to another. Of course, we have greenfield areas where we are already testing and, and making some field trials uh, to see the, well, or to test or, or to check all, all these benefits that, that we are seeing. But of course, again, uh, it is hard to, to adapt all the, well, in our case, in all the Telefonica services exactly the way that we have our logical architectures and, and so on. Uh, so in the end, uh, this is something that, that requires uh, a lot of work from, from us, from the operators, from, from the vendors to, to understand our needs and, and to understand that this is a, a, 
at the beginning at least a, a, a slow process that that we need to to make the the full change and also from the standardization forums so so we in the very near future we we can have these seamless seamless changes of of vendors or improving or, or, or new introductions uh, with these uh, open interfaces that 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 they and we all together are, are developing so in the end uh, the answer is that i would like to to move faster if possible but it is not on, on the hands of of just one 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 entity it's part of of the operators of the vendors and and, and all the organisms uh, within this to to make it Thank you, Daniel. And, and Peter, we've heard what you're doing in the UK, but are you, are you happy with the, the rate of disaggregation? Do, do we need to do more as an industry? Well, well, I think what we need to do is, is, is technology leaders with, with our vendor community is we need to prove the promises. So we need to diligently move forward, prove the promises, and then the, the rate of change will, will, will sort itself out. Okay. And at the minute, I think we're at the very, very start of our network rollout of, of this disaggregated solutions and, and starting to look at SDN. Once we prove the promises, then the rate of PS will, will look after itself. Uh, and I've got huge confidence that we'll prove those promises. And I've got huge confidence that that, that will provide open reach and other operators with a leading edge. Great, thanks, Peter. Craig, what are, what are you seeing from, from the forum's perspective? Is, is there sufficient momentum from the industry as a whole to, to see these changes through? There absolutely is the momentum and the interest, um, especially uh, at the present second, a lot of tier ones, and we have two tier ones here, of course, uh, who are driving that work. Uh, but not every service provider have the resources, the engineers and the skill sets. Uh, and that's where their vendor relationships and also open standards so that they know that it's not just uh, the business model makes a lot of sense, the TCO, the cost and the reduction and maintenance windows, et cetera, um, but that they have the skill sets to implement. And, and that's where open standards comes in, that it's, you know, we work with a lot of the tier ones, pretty much every single tier one in this work of, of SDN, NFE and Cloud CO. Uh, but we need to make sure that the work is there for uh, an implementation path and, and a best of breed deployment strategy that every vendor can benefit from it. Because if not, it is going to be a slower migration and you are going to wait for catalysts in the net, in, in the environment, whether they be convergence we talked about or any other um, catalysts that will accelerate it unless that we have a proof of concept, the business case is proven and the deployment models that make a sense for everyone, tier ones down to the small operators. Great, thank you, Craig. And Ronan, final comments from, from yourself. You know, we, we've, we've heard about the appetite. There's, there's a great appetite here. We, we want to go faster. We want to prove what we've done, done so far. Can you sum up you know, what impact this trend is, is having today and, and what we need to do perhaps as an industry to, to accelerate? Sure, I, I, I think we're on the cusp of change now. We're starting to see some of the largest operators, some of the most reputable, reputable operators in the world going out with their deployments on this. And I think to Peter's point, we've got to deliver against the promise. And once we do that, then things will start to scale accordingly as other uh, operators follow their lead. I think one of the biggest challenges that we have out there is cultural from the point of view that this is different. This is different, it comes with a huge amount of potential, but it means looking at things very differently from how we've looked at them traditionally in the past. And that takes a while for people to get their head around that and to get comfortable with that. And I know with the operators that we've worked closely, they've had to put a lot of concerted effort into focusing in on that and really satisfying those that have concerns about it, that this represents the right path as they go forward. I think the prize that comes with all of this is going to be much faster innovation. Gone are going to be the dependencies that you have with vertically integrated systems. As you know, the next generation of chipsets come to bear on the market that bring greater efficiencies in power consumption and higher port densities, we no longer have to give the, the million nuanced considerations with regard to all the other components that are in a vertically integrated system. Instead, now with a disaggregated system, the only thing we really care about is, can this interoperate with the ethernet backbone that we're connecting it to? 
And if the answer to that is yes, then as an industry, we can embrace these new innovations coming from the component side of the industry and start to bring them to market much more rapidly. And I think that's going to be critically important as we all focus towards green agendas and trying to hit targets like net zero in the years ahead to be able to embrace the technologies that can serve as the foundation for those strategies is going to be key. Excellent. Thank you, Ron. As you say, there, there, there is huge incentive to do this uh, and it's great to hear from you all. We've got to bring our discussion to a closer date. Thank you all very much for participating and sharing your views and opinions. Now, if you're watching this as part of our One Day DSP Leaders Summit on Open Access, then don't forget to send us any questions you have on the subject and we'll try and answer them in our live after show programme later today. And do take part in our online poll. You can find it below this video player next to the Q&A app. Well, I'll be back later today with my colleague Rayla Maitre for the after show. Until then, thank you for watching and goodbye.